Hi there, and welcome to A Song of Ice and Fire Explained. This is a video series where we explain the massive conspiracies going on in A Song of Ice and Fire. If you haven't seen our previous videos, we suggest watching those first. So let's continue on with Eddard 5, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 3,240 words long, and is told from the perspective of Eddard Stark, who was fostered by Lord John Arryn at the Eyrie with Robert at the age of eight. In this chapter, Ned speaks with Grand Maester Pycelle about Lord John Arryn's final days, finds Arya training to be a water dancer on the steps of the Tower of the Hand, and is visited by Littlefinger, who has found four of John Arryn's household remaining in King's Landing. Ned meets with Grand Maester Pycelle in the stifling heat that has covered the city. Pycelle talks about how the small folk claim that the last year of summer is the hottest. The Grand Maester goes on to say that he does not believe this, noting that King Maker's summer was even hotter and broke in the seventh year, leading to a short autumn and a terribly long winter. Then Pycelle digresses about being a young man, forging his maester's chain during the reign of Maker. Finally, Pycelle remembers that Ned asked about John Arryn, and explains that Lord Arryn was melancholy, but healthy, then suddenly became ill. He had asked Pycelle about a book, and Pycelle remembers noting that something was troubling him. The next day, Lord Arryn was twisted over in pain, unable to get out of his bed. Ned mentions that he has heard that Pycelle sent away Lord Arryn's maester. Pycelle states that this was because he felt Maester Coleman did not understand the older body and was endangering Lord Arryn's life with purging potions. Ned asks if Lord Arryn had any final words. Pycelle responds that John Arryn called out the name Robert several times, but does not know if he was talking about the king or his son. His last words were whispered to Lysa Arryn and King Robert. The seed is strong. Next, Ned asks if there was anything unnatural about the death, and follows up by asking if Pycelle had seen anything like this illness before. Pycelle states that he has seen more of illness than he would like to remember, and that every illness is different and yet alike. Eventually, Pycelle says that John Aaron's death was no stranger than any other. When Ned mentions that Lysa thinks otherwise, Pycelle says that grief can derange minds, and Lysa's mind was not the best before, seeing enemies in every corner. When Ned suggests that John Aaron could have been poisoned, the Grand Maester rebuffs him, asking who would do such a thing. Ned replies that he has heard poison is a woman's weapon. Pycelle replies that poison is the preferred weapon of women, cravens, and eunuchs. He continues by telling Ned that Varys was born a slave in Lys, and that Ned should not trust him. Ned scarcely needs reminding, as he already has a bad feeling about Varys. Ned excuses himself, but the Grand Maester halts him to offer any other service Ned may require. Eddard uses the opportunity to ask for the book John Aaron asked for. Pycelle says it is a ponderous tome of lineages that Ned would find boring. Ned insists he would like to see the book in any case, and Pycelle promises to send it to him. On the way out, Ned also learns that Queen Cersei was not in King's Landing when John Aaron died. Pycelle's parting words are, I am here to serve, leading Ned to think, yes, but who? On his return to the Tower of the Hand, Ned finds Arya on the steps, standing on one foot. When Ned asks what she is doing, she tells him that Sirio Farrell says that a water dancer can stand on one toe for hours. Ned expresses his concern about her falling down the steps, but Arya states that a water dancer never falls. Then Arya asks if Bran will come to live with them now, and Ned responds that first he must grow stronger. Speaking of Bran leads Ned to recall taking the girls to the castle Godswood to offer their thanks when the news of Bran's recovery arrived. The girls had gone to sleep and dreamed of Bran while Ned stood vigil all night. While balancing on her leg, Arya asks about Bran's plans to be a knight of the Kingsguard. Ned admits that Bran will not become a knight, but he may become a lord, a counselor, an architect, an explorer, or even the High Septon, even while privately noting that Bran will never lie with a woman or father a son. When Arya asks if she can do any of these things, Ned says that she will marry a king and her sons will do these things. Arya replies that is what Sansa wants, not her. Later, Ned meets with Peter Baelish in his solar. 
Littlefinger, who is watching the Kingsguard practicing in the yard below, starts with small talk about who might win the tawny. This does not interest Ned at all. So he asks Littlefinger to get to the point. Ned cannot find it in himself to trust Littlefinger. Peter tells him that four of John Aaron's household are still in the city, which surprises Ned, who thought that all had gone back to the Eyrie with Lysa. Littlefinger reveals the names, which include John Aaron's squire, Sir Hugh of the Vale. He also reveals that Sir Hugh was knighted by the king after Lord Aaron died. Ned states he will send for them, but Littlefinger does not think this is wise and asks Ned to come to the window. Littlefinger identifies some of the spies among those outside his window. One is Varys's, the other is Cersei's. He tells Ned that there are others, and some even he does not know. He cautions Ned to send a man he trusts completely to question these people, rather than doing it himself. Even Varys cannot watch every man in Ned's service every hour of the day. As Littlefinger departs, Ned expresses his gratitude and says he was perhaps wrong to distrust him. Littlefinger fingers his beard and replies that distrusting him is the wisest thing Ned has done since he climbed down off his horse. And this is where Eddard V, A Game of Thrones, ends. Ironically, this potboy gives Eddard all the clues he needs to solve who killed Jon Arryn. Sir Hugh had been brusque and uninformative and arrogant as only a new made knight can be. The serving girl had at least been pleasant. She said Lord Jon had been reading more than was good for him and that he was troubled and melancholy over his young son's fragility and gruff with his lady wife. The potboy, now Cordwainer, had never exchanged so much as a word with Lord John, but he was full of oddments of kitchen gossip. The Lord was sending his boy to be fostered on Dragonstone. The Lord had visited a master armorer to commission a new suit of plate. The king's own brother had gone with him to help choose the design, the potboy said. No, not Lord Renly, the other one, Lord Stannis. So from this, after reading the book about to be provided by Grand Maester Pycelle, Ned could deduce that John was worried for his son and arguing with his wife Lysa about fostering him with Stannis, whom he was visiting armors with, despite the two never previously being close. We also see the first hints in this chapter that Pycelle is a Lannister crony and directly had a hand in killing John Arryn. Pycelle is super loyal to House Lannister, he convinces Ares to open the gates to Tywin's army during Robert's rebellion, never betrayed any Lannister secrets, and even went to great lengths to cover them up. He testified against Marjorie, immediately sent for Kevin when Cersei was arrested by the Faith, and essentially did everything he could to further Lannister interests, despite Cersei, Jaime, and Tyrion all mistreating him. However, the reason why seems to be revealed in Jaime 1, a feast for crows at Lord Tywin's funeral. Of all the mourners, Grand Maester Pycelle had seemed the most distraught. I have served six kings, he told Jamie after the second service, while sniffling doubtfully about the corpse. But here before us lies the greatest man I ever knew. Lord Tywin wore no crown, yet he was all a king should be. And that's about it for Eddard V, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover John IV and continue from there. Now, here are the differences between the HBO TV show and book. Ned's talk with Maester Pycelle starts in the small council chamber after a meeting of the small council. In the book, Littlefinger tells Ned not only about Hugh, but about three other people who belonged to John Aaron's household. A kitchen girl, a stable hand who joined the city watch, and a potboy. Jory speaks with all of them, but only the potboy provides useful information. Meanwhile, in the show, there is only mention made of Sir Hugh of the Vale. So let's continue on with John IV, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 4,923 words long and is told from the perspective of Jon Snow. When Jon dreams of his lady mother, he considers her to be beautiful, highborn, and kind. In this chapter, Samuel Tarly appears in the yard while Jon is training the other recruits. When Sir Alistair Thorne orders Sam beaten after he yields, Jon and his friends aid the new recruit. Later, Jon talks with Sam and afterwards convinces the other recruits to go easy on Sam, despite Thorne's commands. Jon is helping the other recruits with their swordsmanship when Samuel Tarly, the fattest boy he has ever seen, enters the yard. Sam nervously explains he has been told to come there for training, and Pip identifies him, by his voice, as a lordling from near Highgarden. 
Sam is immediately ridiculed by Alyssa Thorne, who says they are now sending pigs to man the wall. Although Sam has brought his own armor, none of it is black, so he has to be re-equipped, which requires some ingenuity by the armorer, Donal Noy. When Sam returns, Alyssa sends the strong Haldor against him. In under a minute, Sam is on the ground with a broken helm, screaming that he yields. When Sam refuses to stand up, Thorne tells Haldor to hit him with the flat of the blade, until he gets up. The initial hit is tentative, but Thorne insists that Haldor can hit harder, and the next blow splits leather. John's objections are initially stopped by Pip, but after another blow, John shakes him off and states there is no honour in beating a fallen foe. John helps Sam up, which Sir Alistair mocks as defending his lady love. Declaring it a training exercise, Thorne sends Haldor, Rast, and Albert to get past John to beat Sam. John braces himself for a hard fight. Sir Alistair has sent two boys against him before, but never three. To John's surprise, Pip and Gren come to his aid. The boys going against John hesitate, but John attacks. John soon takes out Howder, but not before taking a damaging blow to his shoulder. Then he helps Pip take down Rast. Once Rast is down, Albert yields, and Sir Alistair leaves in a fury. Howder wrenches off his helmet and throws it across the yard, declaring that he thought he had John. John admits that he almost did. When John attempts to remove his helmet, his shoulder is painful. Sam, his head bloody where his helmet split, comes over and helps John remove the helmet gently. Sam introduces himself, and John introduces himself, Grin and Pip. Sam thanks them all. When asked why he did not fight back, Sam states that he couldn't because he is a coward. John and his friends are speechless. Who would admit that he was a coward? Seeing the response of John and his friends, Sam apologizes to them, stating he does not like being a coward. As Sam leaves for the armory, John tells him tomorrow he will do better, but Sam insists that he will not. After Sam leaves, Gren states nobody likes cowards, and he is worried what others will think if they are associated with Sam. Pip's response is that Gren is too stupid to be a coward, and John leaves them to argue. For the recruits, mornings are for swordplay, and afternoons for other work, which is varied so that the watch can measure a recruit's skills. That afternoon, John is to spread gravel on top of the wall by himself. This gives him a chance to contemplate Sam. He thinks about Tyrion Lannister's statement about denying a hard truth, and realises that Sam's admission of cowardice took a certain kind of courage. When he enters the common hall, where dinner is almost done, John passes his friends and joins Sam, who is sitting by himself. After introducing Ghost and some polite conversation, John asks Sam to join him outside to talk. As they walk, Sam admits that he did not think the Night's Watch would be like this. All the buildings are falling down, and it is so cold. John suggests it must have been warmer where Sam lived, and Sam explains that he had never seen snow until a month ago. John leads Sam to the wall, but Sam balks at climbing the great wooden stairs. John replies that there is a winch, but Sam states he does not like heights. When John asks why a boy who was afraid of everything would join the Night's Watch, Sam starts to cry until Ghost licks his face, which makes them both laugh. They continue talking, and before long, John starts talking about Winterfell. John reveals a dream he's been having of returning to Winterfell to find it completely empty. As he is telling the dream, John thinks about how several rangings have been made to find Benjen Stark, whose trail just disappears. In his dream, John always finds himself descending the stairs to the crypt in dark, and it is then that he wakes up. John asks if Sam ever dreams of Hornhill. Sam insists that he does not, and that he hated it there. After a long silence, Sam tells the story of why he was sent to the wall. His father, Lord Randall Tarly, was disgusted that his eldest son was so plump, soft, awkward, and squeamish. Sam's interest in music, books, dancing, and soft clothes only made matters worse. Many masters at arms were brought to Hornhill to try to make Sam into the type of man his father wanted. When a second son, Dickon, was finally born, Lord Randall had given up on Sam. On his 15th name day, Sam says he was escorted to his father where he was informed that he was to forsake his claim to Hornhill and join the Night's Watch, or else his father would arrange an accident. John finds it strange that Sam tells the story in such a detached voice and does not even weep. John tells Sam about some of the other recruits, 
and Sam eventually states that he should get some sleep and plods off. John returns to the common room. His friends explain that they did not shun Sam. There were places on the bench, but Sam was such a craven that he just passed them by. John persuades them all to not beat Sam anymore, whatever Sir Alistair says. Rast, however, insists that if Thorn sends him against Lady Piggy, he will cut off a rasher of bacon and laughs in John's face. That night, John, with Pip, Gren, and Ghost, visit Rast in his cell. With Ghost's mouth around Rast's throat, John tells Rast that they know where he sleeps. After that, no matter what Sir Alistair does, he cannot get any of the recruits to do anything but tap Sam when they are put up against him. Sam later thanks John and calls him his first friend. John responds that they are not friends, but brothers. John now realizes that Rob, Bran, and Rickon are his father's sons, but that he has never been one of them. His true brothers are the outcasts of the Night's Watch. He realizes his uncle was right and wonders if he will ever see Benjen again to tell him. And this is where John 4, A Game of Thrones ends. Now, this chapter mentions someone who becomes very important in the later books and might play a decisive role in The Winds of Winter, Randall Tarly. This belief from Kevin Lannister's opinion of the Lord of Hornhill as the finest soldier in the realm, a poor hand for peacetime, but with Tywin dead, there's no better man to finish this war. And in Kevin's epilogue, he thinks that Tali is the real danger, a narrow man, but iron-willed and shrewd. And he is in possession of Marjorie at the end of A Dance with Dragons. It can also be easily argued that Samwell is a George R.R. R. Martin stand-in, since like George, Sam appears useless in a medieval society, but is actually vitally important. And only thanks to modern society, have we started to really value people like Samwell and George. And that's about it for John 4, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Eddard 6 and continue from there. Now, here are the differences between the HBO TV show and book. In the show, Castle Black is shown to have walls, but in the books, it has none. So the Night's Watch can only defend against enemies coming from the north and not rebel against the Seven Kingdoms, which has happened in the past. In the show, it is Rast who attacks Samwell and then John alone who has to take on Rast, Gren, and Pip. In the show, Sam tells John about his father ordering him to join the Night's Watch while skinning a deer. This scenario was used for the introduction of Tywin when he is talking to Jamie about living up to his destiny, which exemplifies Tywin and Randall being very similar characters. So let's continue on with Eddard 6, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 4,101 words long. In this chapter, Ned and the small council deal with the upcoming hands tourney. After the meeting, Jory Castle reports to Ned that Lord Aaron and Stannis Baratheon visited both a brothel and an armorer. Ned orders Jory to identify the brothel and goes to visit the armorer himself. There, he discovers an apprentice named Gendry, who looks astonishingly like a young King Robert. Ned and the small council hear the report of Janos Slint, commander of the City Watch of King's Landing, about the significant increase in crime caused by the influx of people arriving for the upcoming tourney. Slant requests more men. Ned agrees to hire 50 men, setting Littlefinger to arrange the monetary details. When Littlefinger objects, Ned insists that since he found 40,000 gold dragons for the champion's purse, he should be able to scrape together a few coppers to keep the king's peace. Ned also loans Slint 20 of his own household guard. Ned complains again about the tawny, still irritated that it is to be called the Hands Tawny despite his distaste. Moreover, King Robert still insists that Ned should feel honored. Grand Maester Pycelle points out that a tawny is good for the realm because it brings the great an opportunity for glory and the lowly a respite from their woes. Littlefinger adds that it brings in lots of money, emphasizing full inns and whores walking ballagged. Lord Renly laughs, telling how his brother Stannis once proposed outlawing brothels prompting Robert to ask if he wanted to outlaw eating, shitting, and breathing as well. Renly goes on to wonder how Stannis ever fathered his daughter when he goes to his marriage bed like he's marching to a battlefield to do his duty. Everyone laughs, except Ned, who is preoccupied by thoughts of when Stannis will return and assume his duties on the council. After the council adjourns, Ned returns to the Tower of the Hand and summons Jory Castle. As he waits for his horse to be saddled, Ned pursues the book that John Aaron had been reading prior to his death, Lineages of the Great Houses by Grand Maester Malin. 
Its reading has proven extremely tedious, just as Picel warned, and scarcely a man now alive had been born when it was written. But Ned is sure John Aaron had a reason for reading it. As he browses the section on House Lannister, Ned muses on their long history and the myths of their ancestor, Lan the Clever, who stole gold from the sun to brighten his curly hair. Jory arrives and briefs Ned on his interview with one of John Aaron's stable boys, the last of the four leads provided by Littlefinger. Sir Hugh proved brusque, arrogant, and uninformative. The serving girl could only say that John Aaron had been reading too much, concerned about his son's fertility, and gruff with his wife. Meanwhile, the pop boy was only able to provide lots of kitchen gossip, including that Lord Stannis had accompanied Lord Aaron to meet an armorer about elaborate new armor. The stable boy proves just as informative. He swears that Lord Aaron was as strong as a man, half his age, and often went riding with Lord Stannis. This Ned finds strange. As far as he knew, John and Stannis were never friendly. Jory says that the stable boy also claims that Stannis and John Aaron visited a brothel together. The boy does not know which brothel, only the guards that escorted them would know, and they were taken back to the Eyrie with Lady Lysa. That Stannis would visit a brothel is very strange, because he is so stern and humorless. That Stannis' name keeps coming up, and that he has left the city with no word about when he will return, also vexes Ned. He wonders why Stannis would leave, and decides that something must have frightened him. Yet Ned cannot imagine what could have frightened Stannis, who withstood the year-long siege of Storm's End by surviving on rats and boot leather. Both Ned and Jory find it frustrating that everyone that might know the truth is a thousand leagues away. When Jory asks if he will call Stannis back from Dragonstone, Ned says not yet. Ned plans to visit the armorer himself and decides to wear his doublet with a direwolf sigil so the armorer will know who he is. As Jory dresses him, Ned wonders why Renly was not invited on the rides. Ned does not know what to make of Renly with his friendly ways and easy smiles. A few days back, Renly showed him a locket with a picture of Marjorie Tyrell. He asked Ned if she resembled Lyanna and seemed disappointed when Ned shrugged. Ned finds it queer that Renly, who looks so much like Robert, would be obsessed with a lady that he thought looked like Lyanna. This is the first hint that Renly and House Tyrell are scheming to have Robert put Cersei and her children aside in favor of Marjorie. But when that fails, they instead crown Renly king at Highgarden in a clash of kings and marry him to Marjorie so she can be queen. Ned tells Jory that it would be good if Stannis returned for the tawny, but Jory's response makes Ned more certain that Stannis will not. He also wonders why Lord Aaron would be interested in showy armor when he has always considered armor something for protection, not ornament. Ned then tells Jory that he better start visiting brothels, which Jory jokingly calls a hard duty. The streets of King's Landing are crowded, but Ned and his guardsmen Varley and Jax make it through the crowd to the Mudgate, where Lord Beric Dondarrion is arriving with his retinue to participate in the Hands Tawny. At the top of the Street of Steel, they find the huge house of the armorer, Tobo Mott. After shouldering his way in, a serving girl notices Ned's sigil and badge of office, and Tobo Mott quickly appears, offering wine. Mott immediately tells Ned that his prices are not cheap, but his craftsmanship is unequaled in the Seven Kingdoms. He adds proudly that the Knight of Flowers buys all his armor from him, and that he can work Valerian steel. Ned lets the armorer go on for a while, before he asks if John Aaron bought a falcon helm from him. Mott says that John Aaron bought nothing, only wanting to see Gendry, the apprentice boy. Any hint of friendliness leaves Mott when Ned asks to see the boy as well. In the hot stone barn that contains the forges, the armorer introduces Gendry and shows Ned a helmet that the boy has crafted. Ned notes that the unfinished helm is expertly shaped and offers to buy it. Gendry immediately grabs the helmet back, insisting it is not for sale. Mott rushes to offer apologies for Gendry's behavior, but Ned states there is nothing to forgive. Ned asks Gendry what he and John Aaron talked about. Gendry explains that Lord Aaron asked about his age, if he was well treated, and about his mother, who was dead, but was an alehouse wench with blonde hair. Ned examines Gendry and notices a remarkable resemblance to a younger King Robert, especially his black hair and blue eyes. Ned asks Mott who paid the boy's apprentice fee. Mott claims he took the boy on for free since he was so strong. 
Ned does not believe this for a moment. Mott admits that an unknown lord paid twice the normal apprentice fee for Gendry and said the extra money was for his silence. Ned decides he likes Tobo. Before leaving, Ned tells the armorer to send Gendry to him if the day comes that he wants to wield a sword instead of forge one. It would have been pretty cool if Ned had been able to recruit Gendry into his household guard and this is where he and Arya could have first met each other. As Ned rejoins the guards outside, Ned doesn't understand what John Aaron wanted with a king's bastard, nor why it led to his death. And this is where Eddard VI, A Game of Thrones ends. Now, in A Storm of Swords, Tobo Mott melts Eddard's Valerian steel sword, Ice, to forge two new swords at Tywin Lannister's request. The armor admits that he tried to color the swords the crimson of House Lannister, but despite his spells, the steel darkened to gray and red patterns. However, what he means by spells, we have no idea. One sword is given to King Joffrey Baratheon, who names it Widow's Wail. The other is given to Jaime Lannister, who names it Oathkeeper, when he gives it in turn to Brienne of Tarth. And that's about it for Eddard VI, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Caitlin V and continue from there. Now, here are the differences between the HBO TV show and book. In the book, the conversation between Jory and Hugh occurs off screen. In the show, both Mott and Gendry don't mention Stannis Baratheon accompanying Jon Arryn when he came to meet Gendry. In the show, like everyone else, Gendry's character is aged up. In the books, he is 16 years old. In the show, he looks to be over 20. So let's continue on with Caitlin V, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 3,571 words long. In this chapter, Caitlin Stark and Sir Roderick are traveling north and take shelter from the rain at the inn at the crossroads. Soon after, Tyrion Lannister and his party arrive. Tyrion recognizes Caitlin, who had hoped to remain anonymous, and Caitlin takes this opportunity to convince the men in the room to take Tyrion captive so he can face the king's justice in Winterfell. Caitlin and Sir Roderick are on the king's road, heading back to Winterfell. It is raining, and Sir Roderick suggests Caitlin should cover her head to keep from taking a chill. Caitlin, however, enjoys the feel of the rain on her face and replies that it is only water. The warm southern rain reminds Caitlin of her childhood with Edmure, Lysa, and Littlefinger at Riverrun. Rains are much less pleasant in the north. Roderick states it would be good to have a fire and a warm meal. Caitlin tells him there is an inn at the crossroads, only a short way ahead. Caitlin remembers sleeping there many times when traveling with her father when she was young, when it was run by a fat woman named Marsha Heddle, who was the great aunt of Willow and Jane from the Brienne story of A Feast for Crows. Sir Roderick reminds her that an inn is too public and that it might be best to find a small holdfast if they do not want to be recognized. However, when they pass unrecognized by a party of soldiers led by Lord Jason Malister, a bannerman to her father, Caitlin decides they will not be recognized at the inn. At the inn, they are met by Marsha Heddle, who gives them only a cursory look and tells them there are only two rooms available. She gives them none of the smiles or mention of sweet cakes that Caitlin remembers from her girlhood. After changing into dry clothes, Caitlin thinks that from the crossroads, they could go west to Riverrun, where she could get advice from her father, who has been unwell lately. To the east is the Eyrie and her sister. Lysa might be able to provide some more answers but the road across the mountains is too dangerous. Eventually, Caitlin decides that it is best to continue north to Winterfell. Once past the Neck, they can get aid from one of the bannermen of House Stark. Then, she can tell the bannermen to send riders north to Rob, with orders to place a watch on the King's Road. Caitlin turns her thoughts to the reliability of Riverrun's banners. If it comes to war, Caitlin is sure her father will call his banners, but she is not sure they will all come. Robert's rebellion showed how unreliable the River Lords can be, particularly the Freys, who arrived to aid their Tully overlords only after the Battle of the Trident had been won, leaving doubts as to which army they had come to join. Ever since, Caitlin's father has called Lord Walder Frey the late Lord Frey. Other banners, such as the Darys, Rigers, and Moutons, fought for King Aerys II Targaryen. Caitlin decides she must not let a war erupt. So Roderick comes to escort her to dinner, suggesting they must hurry if they are to eat and calling her the customary my lady. Caitlin decides it might be safer to pretend they are father and daughter. Roderick agrees, but in the process, he calls her my lady again. 
and comments on how old ways die hard when he realizes his mistake. In the long and drafty common room, the benches are crowded with a wide variety of people, but Caitlin doesn't see anyone who might recognize her. So Roderick finds them a place by the kitchen where they are accosted by the singer, Marillion, who asks about where they come from and where they are going. Caitlin answers the safest of the questions, saying they come from King's Landing. The singer tells them that is his destination for the tawny of the hand. The singer is disappointed when Caitlin has not heard about him and proceeds to attempt to get paid for a song. Caitlin asks if Marillion has ever played for Lord Tully. The singer boasts that a chamber is kept for him at Riverrun and that the young Lord Tully is like a brother. This amuses Caitlin, who knows her brother has hated singers ever since one bedded a girl he liked. It is then that the door bangs open and the arrival of Tyrion Lannister is announced, with a demand for a room and a bath for Tyrion. When Tyrion is told that there are no rooms, he announces that his servants can sleep in the stable and quips that he needs only a small room. When Marsha Heddle repeats that there are no rooms, Tyrion takes a gold coin and flips it into the air. A free rider tells Tyrion he is welcome to take his room, and Tyrion flips the coin to the man. Tyrion declares that he wants some sort of roast fowl and wine, sent up to his room, and asks the black brother Yorin to join him. Marillion the singer stands and offers to sing to Tyrion of his father's victory at King's Landing while he dines. Tyrion replies that such a song would surely ruin his supper. He is about to turn away when his eyes find Caitlin, and he comments that he was sorry to have missed her at Winterfell. Everyone at the inn is astonished, and every eye is turned to Caitlin as she stands. Caitlin decides to play her hand. She asks some of the men at arms in the room directly if their lords are true to her father, Lord Hoster Tully. The Brackens, Freys, and Wents are all represented in the room, and all answer with polite agreement. Tyrion is confused and asks what Caitlin is doing, even sniggering at one of the comments. Caitlin then tells the Bannerman that Tyrion, while a guest in her home, sent an assassin to murder her son in his bed. In the name of King Robert and the lords they serve, Caitlin calls upon them to seize Tyrion and return him to Winterfell to await the king's justice. Caitlin cannot decide which is more satisfying, the sound of a dozen men drawing their swords or the look on Tyrion Lannister's face. And this is where Caitlin 5 at Game of Thrones ends. The Inn at the Crossroads is actually pretty infamous for the amount of events that take place there. This includes Tyrion reuniting with his father after escaping the Vale, where Sandor Clegane and Arya Stark happen upon three of Craigor Clegane's men, Polliver and the Tickler, who they kill, and finally, the place where Brienne faces off against the men of the Brave Companion, Rorge and Biter, before being captured by the Brotherhood. Lastly, it was also raised during the reign of King Jaehaerys Targaryen while building the King's Road. And that's about it for Caitlyn V, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Sansa 2 and continue from there. Now, here are the differences between the HBO TV show and book. Jason Malister does not appear in the show and fail to recognize Caitlyn. In the book, it is not Bronn, but an unnamed free rider who tells Tyrion that he can have his room. In the book, none of the Freys who are present at the inn give their swords to Caitlyn. So let's continue on with Sansa 2, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 4,532 words long. In this chapter, Sansa is enthralled by the tawny, but sees Craigle Clegane kill Sir Hugh in a joust. And after a victory, Sir Loras Tyrell gives her a rose. During the feast that follows, Prince Joffrey is very courteous, but afterward, he orders the Hound to escort Sansa back to her chambers. When the Hound notices Sansa is avoiding his burnt face, he forces her to look and tells her how he acquired it. Sansa rides to the Hand's tawny in a litter with Septa Mordain and Jean Poole. The Splendor takes Sansa's breath away, the knights most of all. All of the King's Guards are there in pure white cloaks and armor except Jaime Lannister, who wears his famous gilded armor. The gigantic Sir Gregor Clegane thunders past like an avalanche. Sansa also spies Yorin Royce and whispers to Jean that he wears bronze armor that is thousands of years old, engraved in ruins that protects the wearer. Septa Mordain points out Lord Jason Malister in an eagle-winged helmet and silver-chased indigo armor. The girls giggle at the warrior priest Thoris of Mir until the scepter tells them he once scaled the walls of Pike with a flaming sword. Although frightened by the dark-skinned Jalaba Zoe, 
When Jean sees Lord Beric Dondarrion, she states she is willing to marry immediately. The procession carries on with many knights whom Sansa does not know. To Sansa, it is better than in the songs. They watch the tawny from a place of honor. Jory Castle in drab armor wins two matches, but loses a well-fought third match to the free rider Lorther Brune. When King Robert judges Brune's lance to have been steadier and better placed, the other contestants from Winterfell do not fare as well. Sansa and Jean both scream when the riders crash together. Sansa notes that Jean often covers her eyes when a rider falls, but knows how a great lady must act and draws the approval of Septa Mordain for her composure. The jousting goes on all day and into the evening, so Jamie rides brilliantly, defeating Sir Barristan Selmy, who has already unhorsed two men 30 and 40 years younger than himself. The Hound and his immense brother, Gregor Clegane, the mountain that rides, seem unstoppable. On Sir Gregor's second joust, his lance rises up and impales Sir Hugh in the neck, killing him. Sir Hugh, in his shiny new armor, falls not 10 feet from Sansa. Jean is so disturbed that she cannot stop crying, forcing Septa Mordain to take her away to regain her composure, but she never returns. Sansa is astonished to find herself unmoved by the death, until she realizes there will be no song sung of Sir Hugh. Lord Renly Baratheon, a crowd favorite, is unhorsed so violently by the hound that he seems to fly backwards and the hard fall breaks a gold antler off his helm. Renly gives the broken antler to the hound who merely throws it into the crowd, which erupts in a riot until Lord Renly restores order. By the end of the day's jousting, only four contestants remain, Sir Gregor Clegane, the Hound, Sir Jaime Lannister, and Sir Loras Tyrell. Sansa is entranced with Sir Loras, who is called the Knight of Flowers, and has been giving white roses to various ladies in the crowd throughout the day. Finally, Sir Loras gives a red rose to Sansa, telling her, no victory is half so beautiful as you. Sansa is mesmerized for a while until she notices Peter Baelish above her. He tells Sansa that she has her mother's hair, touches her cheek, and leaves in a very uncharacteristically little finger manner. The king announces that the last three jousters will wait for the next day. Later at the feast, Prince Joffrey sits next to Sansa. He has not spoken to her, and she has not dared speak to him since the fight on the king's road. Sansa remembers thinking at first that she hated him for Lady's death, but later she rationalized that it is not Joffrey, but Queen Cersei and Arya that are responsible. Now, Joffrey is the soul of courtesy, complimenting her by saying that Sir Loras has a keen eye for beauty. Sansa asks if Sir Loras will win, but Joffrey replies that either his uncle or his hound will defeat him, and that one day he'll defeat them all. Joffrey fills her cup with wine, which makes her look at Septa Mordain, but when Joffrey fills the scepter's cup also, Sansa thanks him. He talks to her the rest of the night, making her laugh and helping her eat new foods like snails and trout baked in clay. She can see that the arm Nymeria savaged is still bothering him, but he does not complain. The king grows louder with each course. Finally, drunk as a man can be, shouting at Queen Cersei, telling her, No, you do not tell me what to do, woman. I am king here. Do you understand? I rule here, and if I say that I will fight tomorrow, I will fight. Everyone stares, but no one interferes, and the queen storms off in silence. When Jamie comes to him, the king pushes him away hard, causing Jamie to fall. The king boasts that he can still knock Jamie in the dirt, and that with his warhammer, nobody can stand before him. Jamie replies stiffly, as you say, your grace. Joffrey tells Sansa it grows late and asks if she needs an escort back. With Septa Mordain asleep at the table, Joffrey calls to the Hound to take his betrothed back to her quarters, and deserts Sansa to her disappointment. The Hound asks Sansa if she expected Joffrey to escort her back himself, and scoffs at the idea. Sansa's dreamy night has suddenly vanished. She does not like the idea of the Hound taking her back to the apartments, but cannot wake Septa Mordain. As the Hound escorts her back, Sansa cannot stand the sight of his burned face, Despite insisting to herself that a true lady would not notice, she compliments the hound's riding in the joust, giving him the knightly title, Sir. He responds angrily that he is no knight and that he spits on the vows knights take. He tells her that his brother is a knight and asks if he fulfills her naive expectations. Sansa, lost for words, can only reply that no one can withstand Sir Cregor. He laughs that Sansa's scepter has taught her well. 
She is just a pretty little bird reciting the words they taught her. When Sansa tells the Hound that he is frightening her, Sandor only continues his story, insisting that during the tourney, his brother noticed Sir Hugh's improperly fastened gorget and purposely let his lance ride up to kill Sir Hugh. The Hound, who is drunk, forces Sansa to look at his burnt face. When she starts to cry, the Hound tells her how his brother Kregor burnt his face when he was six for stealing a toy knight. The toy had been nothing to Gregor, who was already a six foot tall squire. He had lifted Sandor bodily up and pressed his face into a brazier. Four years later, they had anointed Gregor with the seven oils, and after he said his vows, he was called Sir Gregor. Sansa now feels sad for the Hound, and is no longer afraid of him. The silence goes on for a long while, and finally she touches the Hound and assures him that his brother is no true knight. They travel the rest of the way in silence, when he finally delivers her to the corridor outside her bedchamber, Sansa thanks him. The Hound's only reply is a warning. Keep the story about his face a secret, or he will kill her. And this is where Sansa 2, A Game of Thrones, ends. Now, this chapter looks to subvert any romanticism of knights as honourable and chivalrous, through Sir Craigor Clegane, who may be an anointed knight, while in contrast, Sandor, Sir Duncan, and Brienne, all three of whom are not knights, are easily the truest knights of all of Westeros. This chapter is also significant because in Sansa 1, A Storm of Swords, Sansa talks to Loras on her way to meet with Marjorie and the Queen of Thorns and asks Loras about the red rose he gave her. You gave me a rose, a red rose. You threw white roses to other girls that day. It made her flush to speak of it. You said no victory was half as beautiful as me. So Loras gave her a modest smile. I spoke only a simple truth that any man with eyes could see. He doesn't remember, Sansa realized, startled. He is only being kind to me. He doesn't remember me or the rose or any of it. She had been so certain that it meant something, that it meant everything. A red rose, not a white. This was probably meant to show how we attach meaning where none was meant. Sansa then goes on to displease Loras by trying to make the rose meaningful. Moreover, Littlefinger's queer encounter with Sansa is noticeable, and this might have been the exact moment when he decided to include her in his plans in place of Caitlyn, because like her mother, you have the Tully look, and you have her hair. Littlefinger leaves abruptly without saying anything sarcastic like he normally does. Lastly, in the jousts, Harwin was unhorsed by Meryn Trant, and Alan fell to Sir Balon Swan, Jaime narrowly defeated Barristan, and Thoris of Mir defeated Beric Dondarrion. And that's about it for Sansa 2, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Eddard 7 and continue from there. Now, here are the differences between the HBO TV show and book. In the show, the Hound isn't shown participating in the tourney, and he spends all his time on the Royal Pavilion. In the show, there is no feast where Robert gets drunk and declares he will fight in the melee, and Sansa is escorted by the Hound Rather, in the show, it is Peter who tells Sansa the origins of how the Hound got his burnt face. So, let's continue on with Eddard 7, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 7,280 words long, and is told from the perspective of Ned Stark, who was nicknamed the Quiet Wolf. In this chapter, after viewing the body of Sir Hugh, Ned and Sir Barristan Selmy struggle to convince King Robert not to compete in the melee. Later on, the Hound wins the tourney when he saves the life of the Knight of Flowers. Later, Varys visits Ned to reveal that Robert was meant to die in the melee. Ned and Sir Barris and Selmy see that Sir Hugh is taken by the Silent Sisters. Barris and Selmy explains that he stood vigil for the fallen knight himself, as the boy had no one else except a mother far away in the Vale of Arryn. Sir Hugh had been Lord John Arryn's squire for four years and had been knighted by King Robert Baratheon after John Arryn's death. Ned wonders if the boy was killed on purpose by a Lannister bannerman to prevent Ned from interviewing him. Sir Hugh's armour is new, forged especially for the tawny, and worth good money. Sir Barristan does not know if Sir Hugh had even finished paying the smith. Ned replies that the boy paid dearly, and orders the Silent Sisters to have the armour sent to the boy's mother. Sir Barristan continues to walk with Ned, and informs him that King Robert intends to fight in the melee. Ned already knows. When Sir Barristan suggests that drunken words are often forgotten in the morning, Ned insists Robert will remember. As they approach the King's Pavilion, they hear Robert raging at his squires, Tyrek and Lancel. When they enter the tent, 
Robert complains that his squires cannot even put a man's armor on him properly. But Ned tells him the boys are not at fault. Robert is too fat for his armor. Robert tells Ned in mock anger that he should not call his king fat and then sends the two squires off to get a breastplate stretcher from Sir Aaron Santagar. After the squires run out, Robert, Barristan, and even Ned laugh at the thought of the boys asking for the non-existent device. Ned asks if the two squires are from House Lannister. The king admits they are, and Ned notes to himself that there are too many Lannisters around the king. Putting the thought aside, Ned asks about the angry words between the king and his wife. Robert takes this opportunity to complain about Cersei's audacity in telling him he should not participate in the melee, and he claims Lyanna Stark would not have done such a thing. Ned insists Robert did not really know Lyanna, and that she would have told him that he had no business fighting in the melee. This does not dissuade Robert, who insists that, unlike Ned, he still has juices running in his veins. When Sir Barrington speaks up to explain that no man would dare to strike a king during the melee, Robert is furious and sends Sir Barristan away, but orders Ned to stay and to drink. Robert laments to Ned that he was never so alive when he was winning the throne or so dead as after it was won. He declares that Ned or John Aaron should have been the king, but Ned reminds Robert that he had the best claim. The king declares that he had not wanted to marry after Lyanna's death and that it was John Aaron who recommended Cersei Lannister. Robert admits that Cersei is beautiful but insists that she is cold and that John Aaron was a fool for recommending the marriage. Robert only agreed to it, so he'd have the wealth and might of Tywin Lannister on his side should Viserys Targaryen ever return to claim the throne. Robert also apologizes to Ned for the death of Sansa's direwolf, admitting that he is sure Joffrey lied regarding the incident. He continues that he dreams of giving up the crown and becoming a sellsword in the free cities but the thought of Joffrey on the throne with Cersei whispering in his ear stops him. Robert asks Ned how he could have made a son like Joffrey. Ned responds hollowly that Joffrey is only a boy and that John Aaron often despaired of Robert himself when he was a child. Robert admits this to be true and claims that he turned into a good king. When Ned does not respond, Robert declares that Ned could at least say he is a better king than Ares. Ned admits the truth in that. Robert insists that he and Ned still have many years yet to set things right and make him a good ruler. Changing the subject, Robert asks who Ned believes will win the joust. Robert comments that Loras Tyrell is a son to be proud of, and regales Ned with the story of when the young knight unhorsed Jaime Lannister in a previous tourney. Then the king mentions that Renly has told him about the King of Flowers' lovely 14-year-old sister, Marjorie. During breakfast, Robert talks with Ned about when they were boys. The stories bring a smile to Ned, who realizes he is speaking to the Robert he grew up with, and if he can prove his accusations, this man will listen. The thought of the downfall of Cersei and Jaime even makes the food taste better, and Ned feels better than he has in a long time. Ned arrives at the tourney and sits by his daughter Sansa. In the first joust, Littlefinger bets against the hound since a dog will not bite the hand that feeds it. He loses the bet when the Hound defeats Sir Jaime on the second pass after almost losing in the first. Sansa tells Ned that she knew the Hound would win, and Littlefinger asks her to tell him who will win the second match. A pity the imp is not here with us, Lord Renly said. I should have won twice as much. Unfortunately, Ned wasn't paying attention to this, and by the time they lead Jaime, who can no longer see through his mangled helm, off the field, Sir Gregor Clegane is in position. He is the biggest man Ned has ever seen, even dwarfing Holdor. Ned recalls Gregor as a man of ominous reputation. Supposedly, he dashed in the skull of the infant Aegon Targaryen and boasted that he raped and murdered the boy's mother, Princess Elia, afterwards. There are also rumors of queer circumstances surrounding the deaths of two wives, a sister, his father, and the burning of his brother's face. Clegane's opponent is the slim and elegant armoured knight of flowers, Sir Loras Tyrell, who wears a cape of woven flowers. After comparing Loras and his opponent, Sansa asks her father to ensure that Loras is not hurt. Ned assures her that the lances break to prevent injury, but cannot help but think of Sir Hugh. Sir Gregor has tremendous difficulty controlling his stallion. When the pass begins, Clegane's mount breaks into a hard gallop immediately while Sir Loras's mare charges smoothly. 
They meet while Gregor is still struggling with his mount, shield, and lance. Sir Loris's lance strikes Gregor perfectly, sending him down with his mount. Sir Loris's lance is not even broken, and the crowd cheers when he raises his visor in victory. Gregor gets up in a rage, demands his sword, and nearly beheads his horse with a single blow. He then strides towards Sir Loris and sends the Knight of Flowers to the ground with his first blow. He is about to deliver a killing blow when the Hound intercedes. Gregor sends multiple sword blows toward his brother's head, but the Hound stops each one, remaining on the defensive. The Hound drops to his knee when he hears the King's voice over the crowd. The blow from Gregor passes through the air, and finally Gregor comes to his senses, drops his sword, glares at Robert, and storms off. In gratitude, Sir Loris forfeits the championship to the Hound, so there is no final joust. The crowd cheers for the Hound for the first time in his life. As they head towards the archery field, Littlefinger points out that Sir Loris had to know his mare was in heat, and that such a thing would disrupt Sir Gregor's stallion. A boy named Angai wins the archery event, and Ned sends Alan to offer him a position among his guards, but the boy refuses. Thoros of Mia, who fights with a flaming sword, wins the melee that starts with nearly 40 men and lasts three hours. When the list of injuries is reported, Ned is pleased that Robert did not take part. That night, at the feast, Ned remains more hopeful than he's been in a long while. Robert is in a good humour, the Lannisters are nowhere in sight, and even his daughters are behaving. Sansa speaks to Arya pleasantly, and even asks how her dancing lessons has gone. Arya happily explains that she is sore all over and shows a nasty bruise on her leg. Sansa declares that Arya must be a terrible dancer. Later, Ned examines Arya's bruise himself, while she still stands on one leg. He asks if Syria Forel is being too hard on her, but Arya replies that every hurt is a lesson, and every lesson makes you better. Ned is worried, but knows there is no use arguing with Arya. Ned returns to his Sola, thinking of what he has learned. He takes out the dagger and wonders why Tyrion Lannister or anyone else would want Bran dead. He is sure that Bran's fall is somehow linked to the death of Jon Arryn. But the truth eludes him. Jory is still in the process of searching the whorehouses, and Ned is sure Gendry is a bastard son of Robert. There is also Edric Storm, a bastard Robert was forced to recognise because his mother was highborn. He also remembers Robert's first child from when Robert was still a boy himself. Yet, no bastard can threaten Robert's true-born children, since bastards have few inheritance rights. A knock at the door brings a stranger who turns out to be Varys in disguise. Ned is amazed. He has never seen Varys wear anything but silk, velvet, and perfume. Yet now the eunuch wears coarse-spun clothes, mud-caked boots, and smells of sweat. Ned exclaims that he would never have recognised Varys. The eunuch says this is good, because he would rather the Queen's spies not know about their meeting either. Varys reveals to Ned that the Lannisters had hoped to kill Robert during the melee, when Ned asks why Cersei would forbid Robert to compete if she planned to have him killed, Varys points out that the surest way to make Robert compete would be to forbid it. Ned is furious that Varys did not tell him, but soon admits that he would have gone straight to Robert, who would have fought to show his enemies he did not fear them. Varys explains to Ned that there are two sorts of people in the Red Keep, those loyal to the realm and those loyal to only themselves. Varys says he now knows Ned to be loyal to the realm because he disobeyed the king from entering the melee. Varys also reveals that Cersei fears Ned because Robert will never harm him, not even at her command, whereas Robert would execute Varys in a twinkling at the queen's request, since the king has little love for sneaks, spies, and eunuchs. Ned argues that Robert must have other friends and that his brothers are surely loyal. Varys replies that hating the queen and loving the king are not quite the same thing. Varys goes on to say that Sir Barristan loves his honour, Grand Maester Pycelle loves his office, and Littlefinger loves Littlefinger. Varys adds that the King's Guard are a paper shield, Sir Boris Blount and Sir Marin Trant are the Queen's men, Sir Barristan is old, and the loyalties of the rest are also suspect. Ned insists that they must warn Robert, but Varys reminds him that without proof, they will only lose. Ned insists that the plotters will try again, and Varys agrees stating that together they might be able to stop them. As he rises to leave, 
Varys reminds Ned to continue treating him with his accustomed contempt. As Varys reaches the door, Ned asks how John Arryn died. Varys tells him that the tears of Lys was used. Varys goes on to say he suggested a taster, but Lord Arryn refused. When Ned asks who administered the poison, Varys claims that it was probably his squire, Sir Hugh, who now lies dead. After Lysa left for the Eyrie, Hugh remained and had the money to buy new armour. As a final question, Ned asks Aris what John Arryn had been doing that led to his murder. Varys replies, asking questions. And this is where Eddard 7, A Game of Thrones ends. Now, what was Varys hoping to achieve with this meeting? Most likely, he wanted two things. Stir Lannister and Stark enmity, while also making himself amendable to Eddard as a potential ally. But as we know from being inside Ned's head, he doesn't trust Varys. Also, the events of this chapter could have been used later by Ned to his advantage had he simply learned to play the Game of Thrones. When Ned calls for the execution of Gregor Clegane in Eddard 11, Loras Tyrell asks for the honour of slaying Sir Gregor, but Ned denies him, and afterwards, Varys goes on to suggest that Ned should have sent Sir Loras, as a man who was an enemy of the Lannisters, would do well to make the Tyrell his friends. Moreover, if Loras had died, it would have likely made Mace and House Tyrell throw in their lot against House Lannister in the upcoming War of the Five Kings. And that's about it for Eddard 7, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Tyrion 4 and continue from there. Now, here are the differences between the HBO TV show and book. The show has Littlefinger and Renly bet on Gregor and Loras' joust instead of the Hound and Jaime, which is completely omitted from the show as well as Robert admitting to Ned that he knows Joffrey was lying about what happened at the Trident and is sorry. So let's continue on with Tyrion 4, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 5,427 words long. In this chapter, Tyrion Lannister finds he has been taken to the Eyrie instead of Winterfell, which will foil any attempt to rescue him. His attempts to convince Lady Caelan of his innocence are interrupted when the Vale Mountain clans attack. During the fight, Tyrion saves Caitlyn and afterwards, he explains that Littlefinger's accusation has a hole. Tyrion would never bet against his family. As Tyrion watches the sellsword Chicken butcher his horse, he chalks it up to another debt owed to the Starks. This mare was a gift from his brother Jaime for his 23rd name day. The sellsword Bronn tells Tyrion that none of them will go hungry, but Tyrion replies that he does not like eating horse, particularly his own horse. Bronn responds that the Dothraki like horse better than other meats. Tyrion reflects that maybe his horse is the lucky one, since he has many more cold hard days ahead of him. As he walks away from the sellswords, Tyrion thinks back bitterly to the night at the Crossroad Inn, when they took him captive. Tyrion had stopped his guard Jike from going for his sword, knowing it would get them killed. Lady Stark showed the wounds on her hands and all around, claiming they had been caused by Tyrion's dagger during an attack on her son. All the people in the inn, who had been friendly enough before, started screaming for his death, with only his men, Jike and Morek, to defend him. Tyrion had no choice but to surrender. His other companion, Yorin, being of the Night's Watch, was sworn to take no part in such matters. Caitlin stated often and loudly that they were taking Tyrion to Winterfell for justice. Tyrion had looked over the crowd and seen that things were not as bad as they seemed. Of the roughly 50 men in the common room, Caitlin Stark roused only a bare dozen. He announced that anyone who reported his capture to his father would get a rich reward. So Roderick then ordered the crowd to remain silent, and had Tyrion struggled not to laugh at the thought that Roderick was fool enough to believe they would. Caitlin then asked for help in bringing Tyrion to Winterfell, and was rewarded with several recruits. As they bundled him out of the inn, he was not afraid sure that they would never get him to Winterfell. However, they pulled a hood over his eyes and made a hard gallop through the rain away from the inn. It was dawn and the rain had stopped when they finally pulled the hood off and Tyrion saw they were on the high road to the Eyrie, not the King's Road to Winterfell, and lost hope. Any pursuit would be looking in the wrong direction and these were the lands of the late John Arryn and his wife Lysa was a Tully. What was more galling than the abduction was that Lady Caitlin had outwitted him. He was spared the hood after that, and after the second night, they no longer bound his hands. Later, they hardly bothered to guard him at all. There was nowhere for him to go. 
The terrain was harsh and wild, the road no more than a stony track, and the mountains contained shadow cats and the dangerous Vale Mountain clans. As they travel, Tyrion makes sure to remember the names of all his captors so that he can properly pay them back. A Lannister always pays his debt. He has a particular enmity towards the singer Marillion, whom he blames for the whole mess, and who is currently looking for words that rhyme with imp for a song about this adventure. Caitlin, Roderick, and several others are discussing their situation and the pursuit by the Lannisters when Tyrion breaks in with the comment that there is small chance that the pursuit will catch them. Curlicket snaps that Caitlin did not ask his views, but Caitlin allows him to speak. Tyrion explains any pursuit will be heading up the neck, not towards the Eyrie. He states they will find no help until they reach the Vale, and that at their current pace, they will only lose more mounts, which burdens the others more. The pace could also very likely cause Tyrion's death, which Caitlin obviously doesn't desire. Caitlin replies that Starks are not murderers, and Tyrion states he is also no murderer. He follows up by telling her that he is not stupid, and would not arm a common footpad with his own blade. For a moment, Tyrion can see doubt in Caitlin's eyes, but she asks why Littlefinger would lie. Tyrion replies that lying is in Littlefinger's nature, and mentions how the man often boasts of taking Caitlin's maidenhood, which Caitlin angrily denies. She calls Tyrion an evil man, but Tyrion calls her a fool, continuing on to say that Littlefinger only loves himself and was only interested in sex with her. Curlicut puts a knife to Tyrion's throat and asks if he can bleed him, but Caitlin again tells him to let Tyrion talk. Tyrion asks how Littlefinger claims he obtained the blade. Caitlin explains that he won the dagger from Littlefinger at the tourney on Prince Joffrey's name day where the Knight of Flowers unhorsed Jaime. The cry of a lookout interrupts them, alerting them to incoming riders, and Caitlin immediately arranges the defence. Tyrion screams to Caitlin to arm him, and his serving men, because she will need every man. Both he and Caitlin know that the mountain clans, who are perfectly happy to slaughter each other, will slaughter Lannister and Stark alike. Laharis slides down the ridge with the news that there are about 25 men, milk snakes or moon brothers. So Willis Wode asks Marillion for help with his breastplate but the singer freezes with fear. Instead, Morek springs to his assistance. Tyrion pleads again with Caitlin, insisting that she cannot afford to waste men guarding them. At her request, he gives his word that he will put down the weapons when the fight is finished, and she orders them armed. Morek arms himself with a bow, being better with it than a sword, and Bronn offers Tyrion a double-bladed axe. When Tyrion comments on his inexperience with an axe, Bronn tells him to pretend he is splitting logs. Tyrion joins Marillion in his hiding place. Marillion whines that he is a singer and wants no part of the fight, but Tyrion forces his way in. The clansmen charge into sight, armed with a variety of weapons and led by a towering man in a shadow skin cloak, armed with a greatsword. The knights and sellswords meet the charge as the others shout Winterfell and Harrenhal. Tyrion has to repress an urge to stand up and shout Castle Rock. From his hiding spot, Tyrion sees Bronn charge through the clansmen, cutting through foes right and left, while Roderick hammers the leader. Marillion shrieks when a rider leaps over them. When the rider turns, Tyrion charges and cuts the horse's neck so that the rider and his horse fall together on top of Marillion. Tyrion then buries his axe in the man's neck and uses this opportunity to crush Marillion's finger with a boot. For the rest of the battle, Tyrion keeps on the fringes leaping out to cut at the legs of horses and kill wounded men, taking a helm from one. Tyrion watches Jayek get himself killed, then comes across Kurilek's body and helps himself to the man's dagger. Then he hears a woman scream. Tyrion goes to aid Lady Caitlin, even as he thinks that he should let them have her. Tyrion gets the first man in the knee and Caitlin kills a second as he reels from a blow by Tyrion. The third man makes a quick retreat and the fighting is over. As Bronn helps himself to Jaik's boots, he asks if this is Tyrion's first fight, which Tyrion confirms. Bronn then tells him that he needs a woman now, nothing like a woman after a man's been bloodied. Glancing over to Lady Caitlin, who was dressing Sir Roderick's wound, Tyrion quips that he is willing if she is. Looking over the dead clansmen, Tyrion notes that they are thin, ragged men with subpar weapons. Tyrion remembers Jaik's bareback charge and thinks of him as a fool to the end, 
Willis urges that they must proceed in haste before more clansmen arrive, but Caelan wishes to pause to bury the dead. When Willis points out that the soil is too stony for graves, Caitlin suggests they gather stones for Karens. Bronn tells her that she can do as she likes, but that he and Chicken have better things to do than pile rocks, such as breathing. When Roderick agrees with Bronn, an angry Caitlin agrees and they ride on. Now there are plenty of horses. As Tyrion mounts Jike's horse, Lamar demands the dirk Tyrion took from Kirkalock's body, but Caitlin intercedes, telling them to give him back his axe as well. Tyrion is pleased to learn that Marillion the singer has broken several ribs, four fingers, and lost his heart. Tyrion is less pleased to find Marillion has also acquired the magnificent Shadowskin cloak. The singer, for once, has nothing to say, and Tyrion can see him cringe when they hear Shadowcats fighting over the bodies they left behind. He trots up to the singer and taunts that Craven rhymes nicely with Raven. Then he moves up to ride next to Lady Caitlin, picking up the conversation from before their interruption. Tyrion points out that there is a serious flaw in Littlefinger's story. He never bets against his family. And this is where Tyrion 4, A Game of Thrones, ends. This chapter is mostly plot heavy, but does properly introduce the character of Bronn and Tyrion's future allies, the Vale Mountain clans. Tyrion also chips away at Caitlyn's certainty that the dagger is really his. And that's about it for Tyrion 4, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Arya 3, and continue from there. Now, here are the differences between the HBO TV show and book. In the show, Caitlyn does not reveal to Tyrion that Littlefinger set him up. Bronn's sellsword companion, Chicken, is also not present. In the book, Caitlyn's party suffers multiple ambushes by the clansmen on the way to the Vale, and most of their party is killed. Chicken is heavily wounded, and Bronn slices his throat to prevent him from making noises and attract more ambushes. The only survivors are Caitlin, Tyrion, Sir Roderick, Bronn, Marillion, and Willis Wode. In the show, only a few of their party are killed by the clansmen in the one attack. Besides ambushes, Caitlin's party also suffers from starvation, and they have to kill horses in order to feed themselves. In the book, Sir Roderick is severely injured during the fight, and Caitlin fears for his life. He ends up barely making it to the Vale. So let's continue on with Arya 3, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 4,832 words long and is told from the perspective of Arya Stark. In this chapter, Arya is chasing a cat when Marcella and Tommen discover her. She escapes unidentified but finds herself in the dungeons. There, she overhears two men talking about killing her father. After eventually finding her way out, she tries to tell her father what she heard, but he does not believe her. Arya is chasing a one-eared black tomcat as part of her training with Sirio Forel. Arya has found that chasing cats is hard. Half-healed scratches cover her hands, and her knees are scabbed from tumbles. At first, even the fat kitchen cat could avoid her. As she stalks the Black Tom, Arya recalls when she originally went to Sirio with her hand bleeding. He told her she was too slow and that her enemies would give her more than scratches. The castle is full of cats, all of which she has caught and brought to Sirio except for this one, which a gold cloak claimed was older than she was. It had even snatched a quail from Lord Tywin's fingers once. Arya has chased the cat all over the castle and she does not know where she is, but she has finally cornered the cat in a narrow alley. The tomcat tries to dart between her legs, but Arya catches it. As she excitedly hugs the cat to her chest and gives it a kiss, she is interrupted Princess Marcilla, at the end of an alley, asks what that boy is doing with that cat. With her are a couple of the guards, a scepter and Prince Tommen. She asks again and calls Arya a ragged boy, which Tommen agrees with. Arya pauses a moment to look at her ragged clothing. To avoid being recognized, Arya falls to one knee. The scepter tells she doesn't belong in this part of the castle. Arya is sure that as soon as she speaks, the children will recognize her. The scepter tells the guards to bring Arya to her. Arya panics and escapes the grasps of the guard, runs over the prince and avoids the other guard. After a short chase, Arya sees a window above her. Not much more than an arrow slit wide. She leaps up, grabs the sill and pulls herself through. Arya continues her rush, ending up lost in a dark cellar and thinking of the trouble she will be in if she was recognized. After listening for a long time, 
she hears no pursuit. She remembers her nightmares of getting lost in the Red Keep, even though her father had told her it was smaller than Winterfell. Arya plans to count to 10,000. By then, it will be safe to come out. By the time she reaches 87, Arya can make out the large shapes of monsters all around her. Initially, she is afraid, but she soon overcomes her fear and makes her way over to touch one of the monsters. She can tell it is bone and that it is dead, but has a feeling that it knows she is there and that it does not love her. She backs into a larger one and whirls around, causing a tooth to rip her leather jerkin. She runs, avoiding a larger skull, and dashes through the jaws of another to find a door. She opens it enough to slip through into an even darker hole beyond. She remembers that a water dancer can see without eyes. As she proceeds down the hole by feeling the walls, Ari remembers that all hallways lead somewhere. Then she hears noises and sees a dim flickering light, which allows her to see that she is above a well with steps leading down. Arya can see two men coming up the well, and hears the echo of their voices, one of which is thick with the accent of the free cities. She quickly discovers that the men are talking about her father when one explains to the other that the Hand will soon learn the truth. When the second man asks what the Hand will do with the truth, the first replies that only the gods know, because the Hand is not a man to put aside the attempt on his son's life and that soon the wolf and the lion will be at each other's throats. The other man insists that a war now would do no good because they are not ready. As the men get nearer, Arya notices that the fat one bearing the torch is oddly familiar but cannot recognize him. When the torchbearer asks what he might possibly do to prevent a war, the fork bearded man with the accent says, if one hand can die, why not a second? The torchbearer insists that the times have changed and that the current hand is not like the other. The fork bearded man insists that they need more time. The princess is with child and the cow will not bestir himself until his son is born. The torchbearer says that if the cow does not bestir himself soon, it may be too late because there are new players in the game. Stannis Baratheon and Lysa Arryn are rumored to be marshalling their strength. Lord Renly and the Knight of Flowers plan to make Marjorie Tyrell queen and no one knows what Littlefinger is playing at. Yet the torchbearer insists that Eddard Stark worries him the most. He now has the book and the bastard and soon the truth. His wife has also taken the imp prisoner and Jaime and Lord Tywin will take this for an outrage. The torchbearer claims that even with his skill, he cannot keep control much longer, but does agree to do what he can, saying he requires more gold and 50 more birds. The Forked Beard responds that 50 is a lot, given that they are so young to know their letters. He suggests that if they could keep their tongues, it would be easier, but the Torchbearer replies that the risk is too great. Arya follows the two men for a long time, going deeper and deeper down the hole until dirt and timbers replace the dressed stone. After miles of following, the men are gone, and Arya, blind and lost, can see no way to go but forward. At the end, she is knee deep in stinking water and eventually she finds herself at the mouth of a sewer that empties into the river. She is so dirty and stinky that she removes her clothes and swims until she feels clean. When she looks around, Arya can see the Red Keep on its hill, miles away. When she finally reaches the gate to the Red Keep and asks to be let in, the two gold cloaks on guard sneer at her because she looks like a beggar. She tells them she is not a beggar. She lives there and she wants to see her father. One of the guards jokes that he wants to fuck the queen for all the good it does him. When Arya insists her father is the hand of the king, one of the guards tries to strike her, but she jumps away and insists she is Arya of House Stark and if they lay a hand on her, their heads will end up on spikes. She offers that if they need proof of who she is, Jory Castle or Veyon Pool can vouch for her. She finishes by asking the startled guardsmen if they will open the gate or need a smack on the head to improve their hearing. Arya is brought to her father in his solar by Tomard and Harwin. He is bent over the biggest book Arya has ever seen. As he hears the report, his face is stern. He then tells her that he had half his guard searching for her and that she is not supposed to go beyond the gates without his leave. She replies that she was in the dungeons and they turned into tunnels. 
She did not have a light and she could not go back the way she came because of the monsters. She then continues to say that two men were talking about killing him. They said that he had a book and a bastard and if one hand could die, why not another? Ned is confused. Arya describes the two men and that they said that the wolf and lion would eat each other. Everything mixes up in Arya's head. She tells her father that she thinks one was a wizard. She decides not to mention knocking over the prince and how she went into a window and found monsters. Ned confirms that the men were talking about juggling and murmurs and tells her that they must be murmurs and that there must be a dozen troops in King's Landing now. Arya tries to tell him that they were not murmurs, but he interrupts her, saying she should not be spying on people. Then he states he does not want his daughter crawling through strange windows going after stray cats and notes all the scratches on her arms. He continues by stating this has gone on long enough and that he wants a word with Sirio. The announcement of an arrival from the Night's Watch interrupts their conversation. Yorin is ushered in and Ned greets him pleasantly despite being stooped, ugly, smelly and in unwashed clothes. Yorin apologizes for the hour and states that Arya has the look of Ned's son. Arya replies that she is a girl and then asks about her brothers since she assumes Yorin must have come by way of Winterfell and if he can deliver a letter to Jon, thinking Jon will believe her story of the men in the dungeon. Yorin explains to Ned that he is there to find men for the wall, but he has other news, news that should be told in private. Ned tells Desmond to show Arya to her room. She asks if anything bad has happened to Jon or her uncle, and Yorin tells her that Jon is fine. As Desmond takes her to her room, Arya asks him how many guards her father has. He answers 50. Then Arya wants assurance that they will not let anybody kill her father. So Desmond tells her that they guard him day and night. Arya mentions that the Lannisters have many more men, and he answers that a northerner is worth 10 southerners. When she asks about wizards, he says that wizards die the same as anyone else when you cut his head off. And this is where Arya 3, A Game of Thrones ends. This chapter hints at the distinct possibility that Yorin is a Varys crony, since Varys already knows that Caitlyn has taken Tyrion prisoner before Ned finds out from Yorin. So unless there was another Varys crony at the Inn of the Crossroads, who had a horse and rode ahead of Yorin to tell Varys, despite Yorin already claiming that he rode hard I did, Nia killed my horse the way I drove her, but I left the others well behind. More likely what happened is that it was Yorin who informed Varys before speaking with Ned or was told to speak with Ned by Varys. To support this belief is that Gendry finds himself with Yorin in a clash of king and escapes the purge of Robert's illegitimate children thanks to Varys who seemingly hands him off to Yorin. So unless Varys trusted Gendry with a complete stranger, he was already familiar with Yorin and trusted him to safeguard valuable proof of Cersei's incest. However, if Yorin is a Varys crony, it's unlikely that he told the eunuch of Arya out of loyalty to Benjen since he knew Varys would take the child and use her, and instead genuinely tried to get her home. And that's about it for Arya 3, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Eddard 8 and continue from there. Now, here are the differences between the HBO TV show and book. Arya doesn't encounter Marcilla and Tommen when she is chasing cats in the show. In the book, Arya finds several black dragon skulls and not just the white skull of Beleriand, like in the TV show. It also isn't obvious that Arya is eavesdropping on Varys and Illeroy in the book because Varys' identity is described as scarred face and stubble of dark beard. However, the identities do become obvious when the reader remembers the scarred man asked for gold and 50 birds, and in the last Ned chapter, Varys changed his appearance. So let's continue on with Eddard 8, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 3022 words long and is told from the perspective of Ned Stark after learning his wife has abducted Tyrion Lannister. In this chapter, Ned and King Robert argue over a plot to kill Daenerys Targaryen. When the small council also sides against him, Ned resigns in protest. As Ned prepares to return to Winterfell, Littlefinger arrives with news that he has identified the brothel that Jon Arryn and Stannis Baratheon visited. Ned is trying to dissuade King Robert from sending men to kill Daenerys Targaryen. 
now that Varys has received reports of her pregnancy. Robert wants every Targaryen dead and grows very angry with Ned's resistance. Ned insists that even if the report is true, a lot can happen before the child is old enough to be a threat. The mother might miscarry, or the child might be born female, or die in infancy. Ned also proclaims that he will only fear the Dothraki when they teach their horses to run on water. Renly comments that it was a mistake to allow Viserys and Daenerys to live this long. Ned insists that mercy is never a mistake, pointing out that at the Battle of the Trident, Sir Barristan Selmy slew a dozen friends of both Ned and Robert, yet Robert absolved him and appointed him Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Robert insists that this is not the same. Sir Barristan was a knight of the Kingsguard. Ned counters that Daenerys is a 14-year-old girl and asks why they overthrew House Targaryen if not to end the murder of children. Robert growls that it was to put an end to Targaryens. When Ned questions how a man who never feared Rhaegar Targaryen can tremble at the shadow of an unborn child, King Robert bellows that he has heard enough and asks for a vote. The other counsellors side with the king, except for Sir Barristan, who states that there is no honour in killing an enemy in his mother's womb. Varys says it is a terrible thing they must do, but for the realm they must do. Pycelle argues that if Daenerys is killed now, it might save thousands in the future. Littlefinger uses a short anecdote to describe killing Daenerys as getting into bed with an ugly woman. Thus, the decision is made, and Robert turns to the topic of how best to carry out the assassination. Renly suggests that Jorah Mormont, who craves a royal pardon, might be of use. Varys reminds them all that Sir Jorah is unlikely to risk the punishment the Dothraki would inflict on the murderer of a Khaleesi. Instead, the eunuch proposes the alternative of poison, such as the Tears of Lys. Khal Drogo need never know it was not a natural death. The mention of the Tears of Lys seems to awaken Grand Maester Pycelle from his drowsiness, and Robert denounces poison as a coward's weapon. Ned remarks on the hypocrisy of debating an honourable way to assassinate a 14-year-old, and declares that Robert should do the killing himself, the honourable way among the first men. Robert is astounded when he realises that Ned actually means what he has just said. Ned grabs his badge of office, declaring that he thought Robert was a better man and refuses to participate further, stating that Robert can do as he likes, but that he will have no part of it. Robert declares that, as hand, Ned will do as commanded or be replaced by a hand who will. Ned wishes luck to his replacement and removes his badge of office, declaring that he thought Robert was a better man. As Ned marches away, the king calls after him that he will have Ned's head on a spike if he ever sees him again. Before Ned has even left, the council resumes the discussion and Ned overhears Pycelle telling the others of a society of assassins in Bravos called the Faceless Men. Littlefinger counters that they can hire an army of swords for a fraction of the price. Ned returns to the Tower of the Hand and summons Vagon Poole to discuss arrangements for their return to Winterfell. Ned is disturbed that Robert still hates the long-dead Rhaegar Targaryen so much. Then Ned thinks about what will happen when the king discovers that Caitlyn has taken Tyrion Lannister captive. The king may not care for the imp, but it will hurt his pride, and Cersei will whisper in his ear. With these thoughts, Ned decides that it might be safest if he and the girls go ahead, and the rest can follow. After Poole leaves, Ned reflects that it will be wonderful to be back at Winterfell with his sons but he remains angry because the kingdom is in a crisis. Robert and his council of cravens and flatterers will beggar the realm, or sell it to the Lannisters. Then there is the murder of John Arryn. Ned considers taking a ship back to Winterfell, even though he would prefer the King's Road, so that he can stop at Dragonstone and maybe learn the truth from Stannis Baratheon. The more he thinks about it, the more Ned guesses the truth is a secret he may not want to know. He looks again at the Assassin's Dagger, and wonders if it has some connection to the mystery of John Arryn's death, and if Robert could be part of it. He remembers Caitlin telling him that he knew the man, but the king is someone different. Ned summons Poole back and tells him to find a fast ship with a good captain, quietly but quickly. If he could find a ship tomorrow, it would be best to be on it. Tormund announces the arrival of Littlefinger. Ned is tempted to send him away, but thinks better of it. Littlefinger informs Ned that he has managed to convince the council to offer a lordship to any man who kills Daenerys rather than hire a faceless man. 
When Ned criticizes the principle of giving titles to assassins, Littlefinger points out that he actually did Daenerys more good than Ned did. If a faceless man were to be sent against the girl, she would be as good as buried. Whereas this way, some idiot will likely botch the job and put the Dothraki on their guard. Ned is incredulous. Littlefinger supported the proposal, but now expects him to believe that he was defending the girl? Littlefinger then calls Ned an enormous fool who rules like a man dancing on rotten ice. Ned insists that he has had his fill of politics. Littlefinger then says if Ned is still in the city this evening, he will take him to the brothel his men have been searching for so ineffectively. And this is where Eddard 8 A Game of Thrones ends. Now, in this chapter, there is an interesting exchange when Varys suggests ways of killing Daenerys Targaryen. Now, poison. The tears of Lys, let us say. Khal Drogo need never know it was not a natural death. Grand Maester Pycelle's sleepy eyes flicked open. He squinted suspiciously at the eunuch. This is probably in reference to John Arryn's death and the fact that Varys knows Pycelle let John Arryn die and Pycelle knows that Varys knows and is terrified he might tell Robert. Finally, Littlefinger's plan of creating a struggle for the throne hinges on Eddard remaining in King's Landing, which is why he procures the brothel Jory has been looking for in order to keep Ned in the capital. And that's about it for Eddard 8, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Caitlin 6 and continue from there. Now, this chapter is adapted pretty faithfully in the show, and there aren't really any differences between the two, except Barristan Selmy is not present in the show, but is in the book. So let's continue on with Caitlin 6, A Game of Thrones. In this chapter, Caitlin and her party finally reach the bloody gate and safety. At her sister's request, Caitlin makes the dangerous night ascent to the Eyrie to meet Lysa and her sickly son, Robert. As they approach the bloody gate, Sir Donald Wainwood tells Caitlin that she should have sent word before coming because the high road is no longer safe. Caitlin replies that they learnt that to their sorrow, reflecting on the six men who died to bring her this far. Three in the first attack, Larys and Chigan in the second, and Morrick of a festering wound. Only Sir Roderick, Bronn, Marillion, Sir Willis Road, Tyrion Lannister, and Caitlin herself remain. They had been sure they were all doomed when Wainwood's men approached. Sir Donald goes on to explain that since John Arryn's death, the Vale Mountain clans have grown bolder, and Lady Lysa has forbade sending men out to fight them, though no one is sure why. Caitlin chooses not to mention that it is Lannisters her sister fears. Looking back at Tyrion, Caitlin notes the dwarf's confidence in the presence of a large party of men sworn to House Arryn and wonders again if she is wrong to suspect him. She is also unsettled by the cunning of the man. Although he remains her prisoner, the dwarf now rides freely, armed with a dirk and an axe, and wearing the shadowskin cloak he won gambling with Marillion. Caitlin asks Sir Donald to send for Maester Coleman when they arrive to treat a badly injured Sir Roderick. She is told that her sister has forbidden the Maester to leave the Eyrie because of her concern for her son Robert's health. All that Sir Donald can promise is the attention of a Septon who tends to the garrison. When they arrive at the Bloody Gate, they are met by Caitlin's uncle, Sir Brendan Tully, known as the Blackfish. Once they have passed through the gate, Caitlin can see the richness of the Vale of Arryn spread out before her, and the peak known as the Giant's Lance rising miles above the valley floor. Her uncle points out the faint glimmer of the Eyrie's seven towers on the side of the mountain, and says they can reach the foot of the lance by evening. When Sir Roderick declares that he cannot go any farther, Caitlin decides to leave the rest of her party behind. Marillion, the singer, asks to accompany her to the castle. Caitlin, who cannot understand how Marillion survived the journey which killed so many others, agrees. Then Bronn, whose ferocious fighting helped cut their path to safety, declares that he is also coming. She dislikes the sellsword because of his lack of kindness and loyalty, and would prefer to separate the sellsword from his fast friend Tyrion Lannister. However, Caitlin cannot politely refuse after permitting Marillion to come, and agrees. As they travel, the Blackfish rides next to Caitlin. Caitlin recalls that her uncle was close to all the Tully children and even Peter Baelish when they were children, despite a long feud with their father, Lord Hoster. It had been in defiance of Lord Hoster naming him the Black Goat of the Tully flock that Sir Brendan had taken a black version of the Tully fish 
as his personal sigil. Caitlin recalls that the feud ended after the dual wedding of Caitlin and Lysa to Eddard Stark and John Arryn, when the Blackfish left Riveron to serve John Arryn in the Vale. After Caitlin finishes explaining her story, her uncle says her father must be warned, since Riveron is right in the path of any Lannister attack. When Caitlin asks what the mood of the Vale is, he tells her that there is anger at the suspicious death of the much-loved Lord John and the title of Warden of the East being given to Jaime Lannister. Lysa has instructed everyone to call young Robert Arryn the true Warden of the East. The Blackfish also gives Caitlin the dire news that the young Lord Robert is unhealthy and cries when his dolls are taken away, leading some to whisper that he is too weak for the seat. Some even suggest that Nestor Royce, who ruled as High Steward while John Arryn was serving as Hand of the King, should rule until Robert comes of age. Others believe that Lysa should remarry, but the Blackfish thinks she is just playing at courtship and intends to rule herself. When Caitlin states that a woman can rule as wisely as a man, the Blackfish replies that the right woman can, but not Lysa. He explains that the death of her husband and the stillborn and miscarried children before that have left Lysa unstable and hysterically protective of her only child. Above all, Lysa seems to fear the Lannisters and now Caitlin has brought a Lannister to her doorstep. Caitlin insists that Tyrion is her prisoner. In reply, her uncle notes that Tyrion is not only not in chains, but also carrying weapons with a sellsword trailing him like a shadow. Caitlin reminds him that Tyrion is not here by choice and that it was Lysa's letter that started the whole business. After passing through a valley surrounded by the high mountains, they reach the Gates of the Moon. Well above the gatehouse, Caitlin can see the looming mass of the mountain and high above the tower keeps of stone, snow, sky, and then the Eyrie. Tyrion jests that if they plan to make him climb the mountain at night, they might as well just kill him now. He is told that they will rest until morning. When the dwarf asks how he gets up, he is told there are steps leading up the mountain and trained mules that go as far as the way castle called Sky. Beyond that, the ascent is made on foot, or in the winch baskets that bring up supplies. The Eyrie is directly above Sky. Tyrion declines the offer of being sent up in a basket because his father would not approve of him going up like a load of turnips if the others ascend on foot, claiming that Lannisters have a certain pride. Caitlin responds that Lannisters have arrogance, avarice, and lust for power. Tyrion replies that his father is the soul of avarice, Jaime has pride, and Cersei lusts for power but he is innocent as a lamb and will bleat for her. The portulus is raised and they are met by Lord Nestor Royce. Brendan asks for hospitality for the night and is told that Caitlin has been instructed to go up tonight, but the rest can have the hospitality of the castle. Brendan is furious, considering night ascent to be too dangerous without a full moon. The guide, Maya Stone, then introduces herself and promises that no harm will come to Caitlin citing her experience on a hundred night ascents. Stone is the surname of bastards in the Vale, and that reminds Caitlin of John. She is speechless, but Lord Nestor states that Maya has never failed him, and so Caitlin agrees to the night ascent. Maya Stone guides Caitlin up the long path to the Eyrie in the dark, claiming that torches only blind one on a clear night. Maya then tells Caitlin that Michael Redfort, a squire she loves, says she has the eyes of an owl, Caitlin knows that, because his family is highborn, the squire will never be allowed to marry a bastard. At each way tower, they switch to fresh mules. The trip to the first way tower does not seem too bad, but the next part is much steeper. At the next way tower, Maya explains that it is called snow because hundreds of years ago, this was where the snow began. At first, Caitlin thinks that, as a Tully and a Stark, there is little in the world to scare her. However, when they must lead the mules across a high saddle between two spires of rock, Caitlin finds that she is too scared to move. Maya comes back and escorts her, blind and trembling, step by step across. At Sky, Maya explains that they must walk the last hour because the trail is more like a stone ladder. Caitlin states, having traveled all day and the best part of a night, she will ride with the turnips instead. Caitlin finds the eerie which can house 500 men, strangely empty. She is brought to her sister's quarters. Lysa, now a plump, pale, and to Caitlin's annoyance, well-rested woman, 
is polite until Sylvardis Egan and Maester Coleman depart. Then she rages at Caitlyn for bringing Tyrion to the Eyrie and thus dragging her into Caitlyn's quarrel with the Lannisters. Caitlyn replies that it was Lysa who sent her the letter naming the Lannisters as the murderers of her husband. Lysa responds that it was a warning to avoid them, not fight them. Roused by his mother's voice, young Lord Robert appears in the door, grasping a doll. Lysa introduces Caitlyn to Robert and calls him strong and beautiful, warning Caitlyn not to believe the stories. Lysa insists that on his deathbed, her husband said, the seed is strong, to let everyone know what a strong boy his son was. Caitlyn attempts to bring back the subject of preparing for war, but Lysa insists that Caitlyn be quiet, because such talk will scare Robert. Lysa then exposes her breast and the six-year-old grabs for it and starts to suck. The sight makes Caitlyn think of her youngest son, Rickon, who is half this boy's age and five times as fierce. Caitlin continues to press Lysa to discuss preparations for war. Lysa replies that even if the Lannisters would bring an army up, everyone says the Eyrie is impregnable. Caitlin realizes that her uncle Brendan had tried to warn her about Lysa. Lysa then asks what she is supposed to do with Tyrion, and Robert asks if he is a bad man. When Lysa replies that he is, Robert says, make him fly. Lysa strokes the boy's hair and muses that perhaps that is just what they will do to Caitlyn's obvious dismay. And this is where Caitlyn 6, A Game of Thrones, ends. This chapter introduces some pretty important characters like Lysa and Robert Aaron and the Blackfish, but also some minor characters who become important later in the story. For example, Maya Stone, Nesta Royce, and Maester Coleman all appear in this chapter. Essentially, this chapter sets up the Littlefinger and Elaine storyline in A Storm of Swords and A Feast for Crows. Moreover, we see the cementing of Tyrion and Bronn's relationship here, which will justify Bronn becoming Tyrion's champion in his next chapter. And that's about it for Caitlyn VI, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Eddard 9 and continue from there. Now, here are the differences between the HBO TV show and book. In the show, only a few of their party are killed by the clansmen in the one attack. Besides ambushes, Caitlyn's party suffers from starvation, and they have to kill horses in order to feed themselves. The Eyrie's appearance is different in the show. In the book, it's a small traditional castle made of seven towers located on a shoulder of a very tall mountain, the Giant's Lance. While the castle in the series is located on the top of a much smaller mountain, and its path doesn't seem to be guarded by towers. The guarded pass Bloody Gate which is the main entrance to the Vale in books, also doesn't appear in Season 1. It is later depicted in Season 4. Neither do the characters of Brendan Tully and Donald Wainwood, who are the guardians of the Bloody Gate. Brendan is introduced in Season 3. Their roles are given to Vardis Egan in the show. Caitlin's journey up the mountain, as well as Maya Stone, the bastard daughter of King Robert, whose job it is to escort people to the Eyrie, is absent in the show. Instead, Caitlin and Tyrion reach the Eyrie together and both confront Lysa in the main hall in front of all important residents. Robert Aaron is renamed Robin Aaron in the show, and Lysa's appearance is much heavier in the book with a pale and puffy face. So let's continue on with Eddard 9, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 2,484 words long. In this chapter, Littlefinger leads Ned to the brothel that Jon Aaron visited. There, they talk to a young whore with a daughter that has the look of King Robert. As they are returning to the Red Keep, Ned's party is ambushed by Jamie Lannister and his men. In retribution for the abduction of his brother, Jamie has Ned's escort killed. Ned's leg is broken during the fight and loses consciousness. Ned finds Littlefinger in the common room of the Chateau's brothel, talking with an elegant black-skinned woman. His guardsman, Heward, is gambling for the removal of clothes with a whore while Jory watches from the window. Ned declares his business done and Jory Castle moves to bring the horses around while Littlefinger makes a joke about what part of the king's anatomy the hand of the king might be filling in for in a brothel. In no mood for Littlefinger's jokes, Ned gruelly declares he is no longer the hand. Outside, it is raining as they mount up. As they ride the deserted streets, Littlefinger tells Ned that he is considering buying the brothel because brothels make much sounder investments than ships. They do not sink, and pirates pay good coin like everyone else. As they ride back toward the Red Keep in the rain, Ned remembers the night his sister Lyanna was betrothed to Robert. 
Leanna told him that Robert would never keep to one bed. Ned, who had already held Robert's first bastard daughter, assured her that Robert was a good man who would love her with all his heart. Leanna responded that one could not change a man's nature. After what he has seen this night, Ned cannot say his sister was wrong. Ned's business at Chatea's brothel was to meet the prostitute with Robert's bastard daughter named Barra. The child resembled Robert, and the girl was proud to show him that the baby had the king's nose and hair. Ned still remembers that Robert's firstborn had the same hair. The girl asked him to tell Robert how beautiful their daughter is, that she has not been with anyone else, and that she is waiting for him. Eddard vowed that she and the child would be well cared for. As he rides, Ned reflects that he is cursed to always keep his promises, while Robert can swear undying love and forget it by the morning. Ned thinks about Jon Snow and wonders why the gods give men such lust only to frown on bastards. Ned then asks Littlefinger about Robert's bastards. Littlefinger says he does not know exactly how many there are. He goes on to speak in detail about Robert's acknowledged bastard Edric Storm, the son of a cousin to the king's sister-in-law. Littlefinger also speaks of a rumoured pair of twins of a serving maid at Castle Rock which Cersei had killed. Ned is surprised that Robert would stand by and let such a thing happen, but then recalls that Robert seems to have grown adept at shutting his eyes. Ned asks why John Aaron would suddenly take an interest in Robert's bastards. Peter suggests that maybe Robert asked him to. Ned declares John Aaron was killed for something more than that, and thinks of Rhaegar Targaryen for the first time in years, and wonders if the Dragon Prince frequented brothels. Somehow, he thinks not. Suddenly, they are surrounded by at least 20 Lannister guardsmen. Jaime Lannister rides up and declares he is looking for his brother, who apparently had some trouble on the road. Ned tells him that Caitlyn took Tyrion prisoner to answer for his crimes. This causes Littlefinger to groan in dismay, and Jaime to move forward and draw his sword. Jaime demands that Ned show his steel, declaring that he will butcher Ned, but prefer it if Ned will fight back. Jamie then suggests Littlefinger leave if he does not want blood on his expensive clothes. Littlefinger needs no urging, but assures Ned that he will bring the City Watch, which again is all part of Littlefinger's endgame, since Jano Slint is a Littlefinger crony and the City Watch will decide the coming Stark-Lannister feud. The Stark Guardsmen have drawn their swords, but it is three against twenty. So Ned reminds Jamie that if he dies, Caitlyn will kill Tyrion, Jamie doesn't believe him, but he is unwilling to chance it, so he tells his men not to harm Ned, yet Jamie refuses to leave Ned entirely unchastened, so he orders Ned's guardsmen killed. Ned and his men are quickly overwhelmed. Heward and Wyle are cut down. Jory manages to break free, but returns almost immediately and is killed. In the confusion, Ned's horse slips and falls, and Ned is blinded by the pain of his leg breaking. When he opens his eyes again, Ned drags himself through the mud. When Littlefinger and the Gold Cloaks finally arrive, they find him cradling Jory's dead body. He is returned in horrid pain to the Tower of the Hand, where Grand Maester Pycelle attends to his injury before giving him milk of the poppy. And this is where Eddard 9 A Game of Thrones ends. Now, Littlefinger's actions to seek out the City Watch immediately hints at his plans to use them when the truth of Cersei's incest is exposed since he knows Cersei will kill Robert when that happens, and declare Joffrey king. But without the City Watch, Cersei cannot hope to control the capital, nor can Ned, Renly, or anyone else overthrow Joffrey without his support. However, Littlefinger can't just tell Ned the truth, because that would out him to the Lannisters. Anyway, that's about it for Eddard 9, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Daenerys 4 and continue from there. Now, this chapter has probably one of the most enjoyable changes from the book, even though it doesn't make any sense, and that is Ned and Jamie's fight. Book readers know that Jamie would kill Eddard as easily as if he were Arya, but the fight between the two is a fun watch, and Jamie's reaction to Ned getting speared from behind actually makes you like him more. Meanwhile, in the book, Ned's guardsmen are on horseback, but they are pulled off and killed with swords. Jory Castle briefly escapes, but returns back and is killed by a random Lannister guardsman. Ned also kills Traeger, the captain of the House Lannister Guard in King's Landing. Lastly, the brothel where Barra and her mother live is not owned by Littlefinger like in the show, but by Chatea, a book-only character. So let's continue on with Daenerys 4, 
a Game of Thrones. This chapter is 3,842 words long. In this Daenerys chapter, the Kalasar enters Vas Dothrak. As they ride up the God's Way, Daenerys discusses the pros and cons of Dothraki combat skills with Ser Jorah Mormont. Once they have settled in, Daenerys invites Viserys to sup with her and makes a peace offering of new clothes. He becomes angry and grabs her. She hits him hard with a belt and threatens him with Drogo's blood riders. The Kalasar enters Vas Dothrak under the Mother of Mountains and proceeds along the God's Way, passing under the gigantic Horse Gate, a pair of rearing bronze stallions whose hooves meet a hundred feet up. Daenerys wonders why Vas Dothrak needs a gate, when it appears to have no walls, no buildings, and no people. All that Daenerys can see are ancient monuments that the Dothraki have sacked over the centuries in the grass on either side of the God's Way. As she looks back at her brother Viserys, who is now mounted again, Daenerys thinks back on the events of the Long Ride East. After the incident on the Dothraki Sea, Viserys had been forced to walk and the Dothraki had named him Cal Remer, the Sawfoot King. Viserys did not realize that he was being mocked. When he accepted a ride in a cart from Cal Drogo, which earned him another name, Cal Ragget, the Cart King. Daenerys had begged Ser Jorah not to tell Viserys the truth, and only after much pleading had she convinced Drogo to allow Viserys to ride again. Now, as they ride past the broke idols of fallen cities, Viserys tells Daenerys that all the Dothraki savages can do is steal things better men have built and kill, which is all he needs them for. He goes on to say the Dothraki cannot speak the language of civilized men, and then states that he is tired of waiting for Drogo to give him his army. So Jorah tells Viserys that Drogo will honor his promise in his own time. Fortunately, few of the Dothraki can understand the common tongue. After Viserys leaves, Sir Jorah explains that the Dothraki are not merchants and do not trade, despite what Viserys thinks. Khal Drogo considers Daenerys a gift and will eventually give a gift in return. Daenerys points out that it is not right to make her brother wait and says Viserys believes he can sweep the Seven Kingdoms with 10,000 Dothraki. So Jorah snorts that Viserys could not sweep a stable with 10,000 brooms. Daenerys asks whether it would be possible for someone stronger than Viserys. So Jorah tells her that when he first came to Essos, he saw the Dothraki as half-naked barbarians and believed that a thousand good knights could put a hundred times as many Dothraki to flight. Now he is not so sure. The Dothraki are better riders, their bows, wielded from horseback, have a longer range, and there are so many of them. Drogo alone commands 40,000 men, the same number that Rhaegar brought to the Battle of the Trident, and only a tenth of Rhaegar's men were knights. When Rhaegar died, many fled the field, and such a rabble would not last long against 40,000 Dothraki. However, the Dothraki have no patience for sieges, and if the armies of Westrode stayed beyond their castle walls, they could hold out forever. Robert Baratheon might be fool enough to give them battle, but the men around him are not. Stannis Baratheon, Tywin Lannister, and Eddard Stark. The way he says the last name leads Daenerys to ask if Ser Jorah hates the man. Ser Jorah replies that Eddard Stark took everything he loved from him for a few lice-ridden poachers and his precious honor. They arrive at the city, which is both the largest and the smallest Daenerys has ever seen. It sprawls ancient, arrogant, and empty across the plain. The buildings are all different. So Jorah explains that they are built by slaves in the fashion they were familiar with. He also explains that the only permanent residents are the Dosh Kaleen, the widows of all the cows who have come before. Yet Vais Dothrak is large enough to house all the Kalasars if they should all return at once, as is prophesied. When they near the eastern market and dismount, each rider gives up all his weapons to a waiting slave. For in Vas Dothrak, no man may carry steel or spill blood. The palace of Khal Drogo is a massive feasting hall of rough hewn logs that make a wall 40 feet tall with a roof of silk surrounded by horse yards and hundreds of earthen houses. Daenerys is met by Colio, one of Khal Drogo's blood riders who informs her that Drogo must ascend the Mother of Mountains that night to sacrifice for his safe return. As Daenerys speaks to Colio, she recalls that the Khal's three blood riders are his sworn brothers who share everything with him except his horses. Daenerys is glad that Drogo does not hold to the tradition of sharing her with his blood riders, because some of them frighten her. 
Blood riders are bound to their cow for life and die when he dies, living only long enough to avenge him if required. Daenerys finds herself wishing her father was guided by such men, remembering the stories of the Kingslayer who murdered her father and Sir Barristan Selmy who went over to the usurper. Daenerys, who is tiring easily as her child grows, is looking forward to a night of rest. She is led to one of the hollow hills that has been prepared for her. She decides to give her brother his gifts tonight. She has prepared Viserys several set of clothes that she hopes will help earn the respect of the Dothraki. She also intends the gifts as a way of apologizing for shaming him. Daenerys orders Doria to invite him to supper and Eri to go to the market to buy something other than horse meat, which Viserys hates. Viserys soon arrives, dragging Dori by the arm, furious that Daenerys would presume to give him commands. Daenerys attempts to explain that Dori misspoke, then shows Viserys the clothes she has had made for him. Viserys only sneers at the clothes, calling them Dothraki rags. Her brother goes on to ridicule her for presuming to dress him, and suggests spitefully that next Daenerys will want to braid his hair. Daenerys declares that he has no right to a braid, because he has won no victories. Viserys grabs her by the arm, hurting her, and for a moment Daenerys is a scared little girl again. Then she grabs hold of the first thing she touches, a medallion belt she meant to give Viserys, and swings it with all her strength. The belt hits her brother full in the face and leaves a deep cut. Daenerys tells Viserys to leave and pray that Drogo does not hear of this. Viserys leaves in a fury, telling her that when he comes into his kingdom, she will regret this day. And this is where Daenerys IV, A Game of Thrones ends. This chapter definitely builds on the last chapter with Daenerys coming into her own as not just an extension of Viserys, but her own person with her own agenda. Lastly, it is a little suspicious how Dora misunderstood Daenerys' request as an order since she has been with Daenerys long enough to know she wouldn't ever order her brother to do anything, and she even said, Dory, run and find him and invite him to sup with me. This chapter also foreshadows the possibility of the Dothraki one day becoming one Kalasar under the control of Daenerys in the Winds of Winter. And that's about it for Daenerys 4, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Bran 5 and continue from there. Now, here are the differences between the HBO TV show and book. In the show, Jorah doesn't seem to hate Lord Eddard Stark, while in the book, he spits at the mention of his name. Lastly, in the show, Daenerys and Jorah don't have as many conversations about how utterly incapable Viserys would be at retaking the Seven Kingdoms. Anyway, that's it for today's episode. If you want to see more of A Song of Ice and Fire Explained, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, when you get the chance, try out Fantasy Flight's A Game of Thrones board game, Digital Edition.